There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did, by sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would uh, teach us and instruct us before this word that, again, Holy Spirit, we invite you in. We know you're present. We invite you to speak to us the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and to lift him up and exalt him. We thank you that you are the shy one of the triune God. It is your delight to glorify the Son and to glorify the Father. And we ask, dear Spirit, that you would do that in a wonderful way this morning, that we might leave this place if with nothing else, being enamored with the glory of our Lord. And we'll praise you and we'll glorify you for your good work as we exalt in the Son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let me summarize for you verses 3 and 4. It would be this. God the Son was sent to earth by God the Father to defeat the power of sin that sin held over us by the work of God the Spirit, granting us victory in our daily walk. You'll see in those two verses there is a, a triune expression. Of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, which we'll be in part considering this morning. When we uh, considered this morning in our scripture reading the account of our Lord Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that day that we call Palm Sunday, in which he was entering in and being received by the crowds with their hosanna and their praise and their, and their expressions of glory, uh, we should recognize that here is a moment in the life of the Lord Jesus in which he was intentionally making an entrance. <laughs> he was orchestrating the presentation of himself to the, to, the, to the great city of Jerusalem and presenting himself as the Messiah. He was fulfilling a prophecy that was made both in Isaiah and in Zechariah in which the Messiah would come and arrive in the city of Jerusalem and present himself coming riding upon a donkey, and it says on the foal of a donkey, and Mark and Luke in their accounts point out to us that, the, that this was a, a, a donkey, a young colt that had never been ridden before. And the Lord Jesus, and that was a fulfillment of prophecy as well. In fact, let me read to you Zechariah 9.9, 9, and then I'll read to you Zechariah 9.10. There it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. And that's what they did. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation. He is lowly. And riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey, the Lord Jesus now is making this messianic fulfillment. He's coming into this point of entrance, and he's not entering with an expression of great power. Zacharias also expresses, uh, Zachariah also gives prophecies of the expression of great power. And when he gives the expression of kingdoms and their great power, he expresses them as horses and chariots that are riding throughout the world and here now is the Messiah that's coming, and he's not on a horse, he's not on a chariot, he's lowly, and he's riding on a donkey, and he's bringing salvation, and his entrance is not one of power, but of humility and of peace. In fact, it's to bring peace that is his message, message, mission. So read verse 10 here, it says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations, his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The Lord Jesus enters in Jerusalem. He reveals himself as the Messiah. Uh, he indicates that his mission is, even by the way and manner in which he enters in, that his mission is a mission of peace. He, he demonstrates, in a sense, this rule and regulation of peace by taking this 
donkey that's never been ridden before while crowds are screaming and shouting and sublimely and peacefully riding in the city on the back of this foal of a donkey. And he's come to make peace, but we know in order to make peace, he has to engage in a battle. He has to break the bow of oppression and cut it off. And I'm not going to argue with you that ultimately the fulfillment of this prophecy is made in great expressions of political power and social upheaval in which the Messiah will reign in the earth and on the earth from sea to sea. But we have to understand that this event that's taking place is taking place just days before Christ goes to the cross. And what we recognize is in the events of the cross and through the agonies of the cross, the Lord Jesus is orchestrating his mission of peace. He's bringing about the salvation that he wants to bring to us. He's laying the foundation upon which he will one day bring peace to the ends of the earth. And he will rule over all the earth with a rod of iron. But it's the foundation for that rule is being laid in this ministry and mission of peace that he's fulfilling in Jerusalem. As he comes in lowly and riding on the foal of a donkey. As he comes in this ministry of peace and enters into a battle a battle that he will fight and he will win for us at the cross. And so from that cross will then ripple out, as we know and as we see his scripture prophesying, will ripple out a work and a, and a movement of God's salvation that one day will cover all the world and then the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters of the sea. And that day is coming. But we have to see that this ripple effect first comes and resonates and ripples through our lives. Its first expression and the first expressions of the cross's victory and battle and conquest is to ripple through your life and mine. And that's what Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Oddly enough, Romans chapter 8, verse 3 is an expression of the battle of the Lord Jesus making way for our conquest of peace in the battlefield of life. There we read this again. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin or for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. And here's the end result. Here's the ripple effect. That the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This is his work of peace. He is going to break the bow of oppression of sin and death and darkness and that ripple effect of his work and ministry of peace that comes from this moment when he enters into Jerusalem to go to the cross, as Paul says, is now available to us. And we may live in that triumph. One of uh, God's great purposes is to provide the way and the means by which we may live in peace by which we may live in a state of wholeness where we enjoy his blessings that he wants to bring to us. And then God gave to us laws to keep in order to maintain that peace, in order to live in that peace, in a, in a world, in an age that was working against and seeking to disrupt the equilibrium and balance in which we could live at peace under God's blessing, God then gave laws and said, listen, fulfill these laws. He gave them to Israel. Keep these laws that it may go well with you in the land that I'm giving you and with your children forever. And God will repeat that over and over again. If you had the opportunity, if some of you are reading through the scripture reading, then you've been reading through that we've given for the year. You've been reading through the book of Deuteronomy. And if you're reading through the book of Don, Deuteronomy, you'll see over and over again, God explains over. It means the second law. Moses is giving to the people of Israel the law a second time and explaining it to them. But underneath the commandments, Moses is constantly explaining to them why the commandments are being given. It's to bless you. It's to maintain you in the land. It's to provide you in a place where God can pour out his abundance upon you. Deuteronomy 6 verses 17 and 18 is an example of this. There it says, you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. God gave the law as a place where we could maintain ourselves in obedience to him 
in the ways of peace so that he might pour out his blessings upon us in the, in the pathways and ways in which God would then orchestrate within us fulfillment and life and benefit and blessing. But here's the problem. There was a failure. We were not able to keep and stay in the ways of peace. None of us have. None of us have been able to stay and maintain ourselves in the way of the law. There was a failure. It was, was not in the law itself. In truth, the law didn't provide, fail in providing us the way of peace. <laughs> we failed in maintaining ourselves in that way of peace. We failed in keeping the law and living in that way. And the weakness is not in the law. It's in our flesh. It's in ourselves. Summing up what we've been talking about for some time. Before a person is saved uh, by Jesus Christ, they have sinful, unregenerate natures that reside in these bodies of flesh. And in those and with those sinful, unregenerate natures, they sin. And so their body of flesh is infected both by their sinful natures and by the sin they commit with those sinful natures. And then after you come to Christ and you believe in Him and receive Him as your Savior, that old man, that old nature is put to death. You can read about that in Romans chapter 6, verses 2 through 4. And it's crucified with Christ. And it's done away with. And it's dead. And you receive a new nature that is given to you that resides in your body. But your body is still infected by the sins that you've committed and the sinful nature that you had before that moment. And your body still maintains a weakness a weakness that in and of itself and by its own energy and by its own power is incapable of staying within and maintaining itself within the law that would bring you into a life of peace and blessing. You can't do it. You fail. The law was weak in this sense. It couldn't make you keep it. And it couldn't help you in your flesh to keep it. Your flesh just keeps failing. In fact, it only points out to you, you can't keep it in your flesh. So you fail and you stumble and you try and try to do your best, but you... You don't make it. You discover that in your flesh there dwells no good thing, and you're not able to maintain yourself in the way of peace. But here's the good news for the believer, and we've looked at this in the last two weeks. The first good news is no matter how you falter, no matter how you stumble, no matter how you fail, no matter though you have a new spirit in Christ, your body is not supporting it. It's not working in cooperation with it. You've got a battle that's going on not only with the world and not only with Satan, but you've got a battle with your own flesh. You fail at times and you stumble and you falter. And the good news is this, you're not condemned. There's no condemnation for us. We have received the full forgiveness from our Savior Jesus Christ and the work that he's accomplished for us that forgives us of all the past sins and all of our present sins and all, all the sins of the future. All of it was laid upon Christ at the cross and it's ours and it's available to us. And I don't, I don't carry out my life and live my life to somehow mitigate further condemnation in my life. I don't carry out my life and try to live the Lord Jesus to alleviate some uh, judgment that's out there waiting and pending to fall upon me if I slip up again. I'm not holding on to try to maintain my salvation. It is mine in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, there's no condemnation, none whatsoever. What a burden lifted when I come before the law that I'm not trying to maintain, you might say, the peace that I have with God. I'm at peace with him through Jesus Christ, my Lord. And yet, at the same time, there are blessings and benefits that I would realize and know in my life, and there would be an exuberance of joy that I would express that I can't do just living in my own power, my own flesh. I have to realize that and know that by the Spirit working through me. So here's the other thing that we saw. We learned this last week. Not only is there no condemnation for us, but now has been opened to us freedom, complete freedom. Freedom through the law of the Spirit of Christ. The, the, the law of sin and death is me in my flesh meeting the law and trying to, to grovel and work and labor and do everything I can to prove myself in my flesh that I can keep the law and all I'll do is multiply sin and death. But the same law is there, but now I meet it in the Spirit that's been given to me freely. And He communicates to me the life of the Lord Jesus Christ who lived an abundantly free life. The freedom of our Savior was so potent and powerful that He ministered that freedom to everyone with a touch. Delivering men from demonic bondage. Delivering people from the bondage of their sickness and disease. And speaking the word that says, whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. And He was the freest man we've ever known. And yet, what we learned last week was, He came under the law. And He came to fulfill the law perfectly. And His freedom was found not apart from the law, but within it. 
Here's, here's the other promise. We're not condemned by the law. We're free from the law's condemnation, but we're also through the power of the Holy Spirit given to us as born-again believers in Jesus Christ. We're free in the law by the power and life of Jesus Christ to live to his glory and to honor, and it becomes an expression of abundance and blessing and benefit and joy and abundant life in the Spirit. The same law now met by the Spirit, met in my flesh is just a law of sin and death, but met by the abounding, outpouring fullness of the Spirit becomes a, a law of life and liberty and joy, the very life and liberty and joy that the Lord Jesus lived. So they said, I've come that you might, my joy might be in you and that your joy might be complete. And I've come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. And if you come to me, I'll pour my Spirit out in you and out of your inmost being will flow rivers of living water, free. Not free from the law, but free in the law to express the glory and the majesty of all that God is. And that's ours before us. That's waiting before us. The, the law now takes on a, a different means to itself for us. It's, it's not towering over us as a message of condemnation against our flesh and our powerlessness. But now because of the power that's availed to us through the Spirit, the law comes before us as an invitation to step up into the life of Jesus Christ. Let Christ express Himself and express His glory and His majesty through us. So now we come to verse 3. And verse 3 tells us how this freedom comes to us, how this freedom to, from condemnation comes to us, how this freedom from the condemnation of law comes to us, and how this freedom in the law, in the infused power of the life of the Spirit comes to us, a life of blessing and peace and victory. This Spirit infused life, how it was made possible for us. And it says it's made possible for us because our Lord Jesus came to deal with the cause of our ongoing defeats. It says that the Father has sent His Son to earth on a mission. He came on account of sin. and He came to deal with sin. You see that passage where it says He came on account of sin here in verse 3? Some of your translations might read that he came to be a guilt offering. And the reason they say that is because in the Septuagint and some of the translations that are found of Old Testament passages in the Greek, this same phrasing is used to speak of the guilt offerings that were made in the temple. So uh, the, the translators are assuming that what's being spoken of here is the expiatory uh, exp expiation that Christ was going to offer in the temple for our sins, the atoning sacrifice he was made. So he, he came to be an atoning sacrifice for sins is what they're saying. But in this passage that we're looking, Paul does not surround that phrase with the imagery of the temple. He simply says, and he's been talking about our struggle with sin in the flesh. He simply says, Jesus came, was sent by God to address or for our sins. It's not just about being taking on the punishment for our sins. It's coming against the very power that sin holds against us. He came to address the power that sin held against us in order that he might gain a victory over the chronic expressions of sin that plague our own lives. He was sent to deal with the sin that we've been not been able to deal with in our own strength. And that's why the very first sentence I read to you is, God the Son was sent to earth by God the Father to defeat the power of sin in us and to make available to us through God the Spirit victory over sin, power to defeat sin in our daily life. Jesus came. Jesus carried out a ministry in which he was victorious over sin, and he makes that victory available to us. He brings it to us. Let's consider how it was he did this. The rest of the verse that we're going to consider is how the Lord Jesus brought to us this victory. And the first thing I want you to see is this. He did it in a body of flesh just like ours. He did it in a body of flesh just like yours and mine. It says here, in the likeness of sinful flesh. And here's what that means. The Lord Jesus took on a body that is just like the one you and I have, with only one difference. <laughs> Our bodies have been contaminated first by our sinful natures, which has been taken away if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, but then also the sins that you've committed with that sinful nature. And what remains within us is the residue or contagion and weakness of sin infecting our bodies. 
The Lord Jesus had a body just like yours and mine. It's a body that got tired. It's a body that was subject to cravings. It's a body that knew hunger and thirst and felt pain. And it was a body that aged and wore away with time. Think about that. The eternal Son of God subjected himself and his body to the vagaries of time. And yet Jesus came with a body that was not touched by the weaknesses of his own sinfulness. It was unsullied by any sin that he had introduced into it. He, he was born in a body like ours, but, and, and it was a body that could be touched by the weaknesses of sin. It was a body that could have been plagued by those same contagions if he should have introduced it to himself, but he didn't. The Bible says of our Savior that he was tempted on all points like us without sin. He was tempted in every way without sin, but it was a body that could have adhered to or taken or absorbed and become infected by sin like ours. Should he have sinned? It was the same body that we have. Body that was weak. And the point here is that he, he didn't come to our defense wearing some supernatural armor that could not be perpetrated on by evil, but he came to face the evil of this world and the evil of the temptation of this world and this age and the dark powers of Satan himself, and he came to face it and confront it in a body just like ours. You could read about the baptism of the Lord Jesus after he's baptized. Mark and Matthew and Luke all tell us that the Lord Jesus went into the wilderness and there in the wilderness, he was tempted by Satan. And what you'll discover is that he was tempted by Satan after he had gone without food for 40 days. And it says he was hungry. He was weakened physically. And it was in his weak physical state that the enemy came and tempted him. And the enemy applied his temptations to the Lord Jesus at the very places where the enemy might tempt you and I. They tempted, they hit upon his physical desires. They hit upon his desires for significance. They hit it upon uh, a physical desire for ascendancy. It did it by exaggerating the value of things and putting the value of things above the value of serving God alone. But these were all temptations that were brought to them. They were temptations that were brought to him in order that, and they were, they were, they were placed at a place that would stir up a, a challenge to cause Satan, or Satan would seek to make the Lord Jesus doubt God, or test God, or go forward and initiate himself without God. And the point here is that the Lord Jesus met all this. You know, the other thing is it says that after the temptations that the angels came and ministered to the Lord Jesus. But here's the point. They didn't minister to him in his temptations. He still had to go through them just like us. He still had to face him in a body just like ours. And if you're going to fight a battle, you got to fight a battle where the enemy engages you, where the enemy meets you. And the place where the enemy engages you is in your body, in your flesh. And so God sent his son to engage sin and darkness and death and Satan and its temptations in a body just like yours and mine to help bring us victory. I was thinking about this uh, the other day. I, I, I told this story to individuals individually. It's a kind of a shocking story. And so I, I, it's one that you usually don't share from the pulpit. I'll hold some of it back. But you've heard me tell stories of when I was a little boy and I was being bullied by some children at school that were about three grades older than I. And at the time that it happened, my, my grandfather was visiting us. And when I was little, my, my grandfather used to like to regale us with stories, and his stories were always about beating people up on the playground, you know, defending himself and surviving. And uh, so anyhow, my grandfather caught wind somehow that I was being preyed upon by these two older boys that were like, I was like a second grader, and they were like fifth or fourth graders. And grandpa took me down into the basement and wanting to help me and wanting me to find victory, uh, pulled out from his pocket some brass knuckles. <laughs> and suggested that I put him in my pocket and take him. And he gave me some other advice that I could share with you later on. But, you know, here, honey, I mean, he was being really tender with me. Here, honey, take these with you and defend yourself, in essence, he was saying. And you'll be all right. And I know, Grandpa, I can't take that. I'll get in trouble. So Grandpa then, you know, was trying to reason with me. Well, look at there. Where on the playground would there be a pile of rocks? Are there a pile of rocks? In my so when you get out during recess, go to those pile of rocks and put some rocks in your pockets. And if they come at you, pull those rocks. And so he's coaching. Now, dear, listen, and he's being very tender. 
was trying to teach me how to fight the battle. And I was thinking that it would have been better if Grandpa would have just showed up, you know, on the playground with me. You know, it would have been easier if he would have just showed up in the place where I was confronting this and helped me deal with it, but he, he didn't. And I continue to be preyed on by those boys because I didn't go by the pile of rocks and I didn't take the brass knuckles. The Lord Jesus knows where the battle is in your life. God knows where the enemy is coming against you and seeking to destroy you and, and bringing you deliverance. He comes to that battleground. He clothes himself in the very place where the battle is fought within our own flesh. It's in that place, taking up our battle in our place, taking upon himself bodies just like us that he seeks to bring us into victory. And as you see him coming, you should say, Hosanna. Think about it. When the Lord Jesus is coming, riding on this donkey, uh, and the people are out crying Hosanna because they're shouting these words as if, save now, deliver us. Our Savior, our Messiah has come. And they're anticipating this great worldly political Messiah. And you might think of the soldiers that are, have come into the city of Jerusalem, the Roman soldiers that have been imported in the city of Jerusalem during this festival, because this is when riots take place, and you've got to make sure that the people live in order. And now their attention is drawn to the image of their great Savior coming in, and it's this humble man riding on a donkey. And not only that, Luke tells us, as he came down into the city and looked over to the city of Jerusalem, that he wept profusely. Weeping over. So it's not a man of might and power. It's this weeping man on the back of a little donkey. And this is the one that's going to save us. And they don't know the incongruity of what they're declaring. But those Roman soldiers must have scoffed when they saw it. Look at the man. After he's beaten and battered. And Pilate brings him before the people. Trying to have the people have sympathy on the beaten, battered, bruised body of Jesus. said, behold the man. Look at him in his weakness and have sympathy and see how pathetic he is. No, that's you and I. That's you and our flesh and our own power. It's weak. It's pathetic. It doesn't have extenuating strong powers within it. And it's there that the enemy comes and attacks us and where sin gets hold of us and ravages us. And it's in a body just like that. That God sent his son to deliver and rescue us. Jesus came in a body just like ours to fight the victory that we have fought over and over again and lost, but once and finally and for all to win it on our behalf. How wonderful, how wonderful and glorious the weakness of God is all powerful. The seeming foolishness of it, such profound wisdom. Here's the second thing I'd have you see. This is what he accomplished in the flesh that he came. He condemned sin within that body. He condemned sin in his flesh. What does it mean when it says that he condemned sin? We, we have to recognize something. In this passage, it's not simply some judicial thing where he makes a statement. Sin is bad and sin needs to be judged. Or, I'm going to pay the consequences of your sins. Condemned here has the idea that he carries it out to the point of full execution. He executes it. He confronts it. He deals with it. He executes it. And so, we have to ask ourselves, in what way did in a body like ours, did the Lord Jesus do this? And the first thing we need to see is this. How is it that he condemns sin within his body? And the first thing we can say is this. It means that the Lord Jesus, in a body just like ours, took temptation and the sin head on. He met the temptation to sin head on. He, he met it where it seeks to plant its seeds of death in us. And there he exposed sin as it sought to gain hold of him through temptation. And in the flesh, he took in and drank the tempting powers of sin that all of us face and that all of us eventually fold under, and Christ spat it out, victorious over it. He put it aside with a rebuke. We can see this happening in the temptation that we talked about following his baptism. Those temptations came to him in order. The first temptation was a temptation that he fulfilled his physical desires uh, that, that's what was lying behind this enticement to sin, that he would 
fulfill his physical desires, doubting that God knew best how to meet his needs and provide for him and to service and minister him. And the Lord Jesus answers the temptation with a rebuke. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then there's a temptation that comes to him to find significance, to somehow prove that God really loved him and God would care for him and God would meet him. Cast yourself down from this tower. If God really loves you, he says his angels will keep you from falling and he'll pick you up in the angel's wings. And so see, prove for yourself. Prove if you really love. Prove if you have that kind of significance or not. Prove your significance. That's something we all want, we all long for, feel that we're significant and important. And so the real temptation is put God to the chest. See if God really does treasure you or not. The Lord Jesus answered, it's written, you'll not put the Lord your God to the test. God, in a sense he's saying, does not need to prove himself to me. And I have no right to demand that he do so. I'll not do it. He's tempted again. This time he's tempted to gain ascendancy by placing worth upon things that are independent of God. And he, I'll give you all these things. You'll possess all these things. You know that God has placed within us a nature that is acquisitional. It desires to possess things. And the Bible actually says one day we will possess and, and we will co-heirs with Christ of all of glory. We were made for that. We were made for all that the world and all the universe has to offer us. Flesh, though, says, I want to gain that now. I want to gain this in short order. And I, if I rush to it and gain it that way, I'll exalt the thing above the thing to be worshipped, above everything else, which is God alone. And I'll end up serving those things. And that's what idols are ultimately. Idols are things that you've sought to use to gain prestige or power or prominence or pleasure, and you serve them. And the Lord Jesus answers, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God. And him only you shall serve. And the Lord Jesus cut through to the temptation to sin or the sin that was behind every temptation. The sin that seeks to say here, find life here without God. And ultimately it's not life at all. It's just death. It's destruction. And the Lord Jesus denied it and reproached it and claimed the life that came in submission to God and his word alone. Jesus' first act in condemning sin in the flesh was meeting sin's temptation. All throughout his life, meeting sin's temptation and conquering it with perfect obedience. Conquering it with perfect obedience in every way. In this way, in the body that Christ was given and that he lived in, he executed a judgment upon sin. He beat back sin with perfect obedience. Look in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verse 13. This is just a bit of a preview that's coming to us. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. It says this, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Well, if you make these compromises that you think are going to lead you to death, you'll, it'll, bring you, it'll bring, bring you to life. It'll lead you into death instead. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live question is, how do you put to death through the Spirit the deeds of the body? What kills, that's really, putting to death sin is what it's saying. But what puts to death sin, what executes judgment on sin, you know what it is? Righteousness. <laughs> it's righteousness. It's by the Spirit living a righteous life, a surrendered, obedient life, and through the Spirit, only through the Spirit can you accomplish this and consistently live in it. And, and as you do, you are executing with Christ through the Spirit, through the sword of the Spirit, a judgment upon the power of sin. One of the things you'll read when you read the book of Romans is that on multiple occasions, Paul will speak about sin and he'll almost personify it as something that has some kind of inter, in, uh, independent power. He'll say that sin entered into the world and he gives it this kind of personification and he's doing it for a purpose because it's what you have to battle against. I'm going to give you victory through I'm going to give you victory. You're going to execute judgment on it through Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. But this is what Christ came to do. He executed judgment on sin by facing every temptation with perfect obedience. If I could take an excursion for a period of time, which we won't do, from the book of Romans, I would pause here and do a series of messages on the moral glory of Jesus Christ. How perfect he was in everything he did, 
in every situation. Think about the story we just read of the Lord Jesus coming into Jerusalem with the people pouring out the praise upon him. And yet he receives it. He even orchestrates that praise, but he doesn't get lost in it as we would. He weeps over the city as they're singing their praises to him. He doesn't then, he then into the authority that moment he goes and he cleans out the temple with great authority, exercising the authority that is his. He doesn't deny the praise. If they didn't praise me, if these children didn't praise me, the very rocks would cry out to praise me. He knows what is appropriate for himself. And he knows how to be abound in the praises that people give him without losing himself in those praises. Then at the same time, at the end of the day, he says he went out to Bethany. He had no place to go. There was no palace for him to enter in. He, he went out abased from the city to Bethany where Mary and Martha were to provide a house for him to live and stay in. And our Savior knew, morally knew, and lived out a perfect life in which he knew how to be, to abound and to be abased. And it never once fluctuated or changed the beautiful moral character of his life, the glory of his life. Perfect in every way. Not true of us. I don't know how to obey bound. I get a fat head. I don't know how to be abased. I feel sorry for myself. Perfectly glorious in every way. Oh, the glory of our Savior. Meeting every temptation and every trial with perfect moral majesty. And so executing sin by his perfect righteousness. Here's the second thing. In that body of flesh that he lived a sinless life. He then went to the cross and he presented to God the perfect righteousness that was his and he presented it to God on our behalf. When I travel overseas, we talk about what a mediator is. A mediator is somebody who represents God to people, but also somebody who represents people to God. And we mediate for people by going before God and acknowledging their sins and praying for them and their troubles and their trials and then we ask a question, how did, how did the Lord Jesus on the cross perfectly represent God to us? And they, they name off different attributes of God that might be displayed in the cross. And they, they can never name enough because they're all there in some wonderful way. But then we say, well, how did he represent us to God, to God, man to God? And they, their answer is always the same. He presented us to God in our wretchedness and our sin. It's true, he did. But not at first. When he first went to the cross, he went as the sinless lamb of God. He went as the perfect man who is perfect and complete and total righteousness. You could not bring as an offering to God anything that was defiled, anything that was not perfect and pure in every way. The Lord Jesus brought before the Father everything that God intended you and I to be in this body. Perfect. When God first made man, he looked over his creation and said, it's good, it's all good. And then in Genesis chapter 6, it says God repented that he had made man. It had gone bad. It had gone bad. At the cross, as Jesus went to the cross for us, it was all good again. It was all good again. He is everything that God intended us to be. He fulfilled it perfectly in a body like ours. And then he raised it up to the Father and said, Lord, this is what I've come to make of them. And this is what, through my victory and power over sin, I will make of them. Receive them in my righteousness. Receive them in anticipation of all that they will be in me. How wonderful. How glorious. Our life of victory in the Spirit has been made possible because Christ perfectly fulfilled all righteousness in a body just like ours. And our life of righteousness is made possible because God presented that prospect before the Father. Here's what we'll make of them. And they're going to make that of us. They're going to work that in us. And the first fruits of that victory are available to us today. Available to us now. Through Jesus Christ and through the Spirit. We can walk in that power, in that life as he, he lives in us and as He abides in us and as He presents and empowers us by the work of the Holy Spirit. That's available to us now. Now, I've got a few more pages, but we'll stop here. This is a good place to stop. This is a wonderful place to stop. 
You do yourself a service by studying the life of the Lord Jesus. I have at times criticized the idea that we should ask over the life of the Lord Jesus, what would Jesus do? Now, this is a question, by the way, that's not just asked by Christians. Politicians that want to get an upper hand for their policy will periodically present the question as well that Jesus would have driven an EV or something like that. You know, he would have, what would Jesus do? And we might, we might criticize their conclusions, but here's what they're telling us. Deep down inside, the they know Jesus would do the right thing. <laughs> he would always do the right thing. He always did the right thing. Perfect and complete righteousness. It's not a bad place, actually, to start. What would Jesus do? What did Jesus do? Study his life. Read the accounts for no other reason for the moment than to recognize a perfectly sinless, righteous man who presented his righteousness before the Father as the prospect of what he would make of us in himself and what he would do through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now recognize that Christ has been given to us and resurrected power given to us through the Spirit to live that life in us. It's the basis. It's the foundation for the freedom that we have in the law where we come to it and we, we, we leap into it as an expression, an exuberant expression of the free, abounding life that was in the Son. That may be in us. That may be in us. Let's never discount it. Let's never put it aside. Yes, at the cross, Jesus Christ also dealt with sin's penalty. He took that body that we just mentioned that is subject to the infection of sin. His was as well. His body could have been infected by sin, but it wasn't. He lived it in a perfect, sinless way. He offered up that perfect, sinless body before the Lord as a presentation of what He'd make of us. And then in that same hour, He let the infection of our sin be poured into His body. And He who knew no sin became sin for us, that He might bear its penalty and punishment as well. Only in a body could He have done that. Only in a body like ours could he have done that for us so that on every side he would win our salvation over its power, over its penalty in a body like ours, in the flesh, condemning sin in our flesh just like ours. How wonderful, how glorious, how profound, so worthy of worship, so worthy to seek him out, pursue him, know him, Yield to him. Let the Spirit bring his life to you. Let's bow our heads. Oh God, should we let ourselves be swept away? What wonder could be ours when we see all that you've done for us, Lord Jesus? How pure and perfect you kept that body prepared for you. And then how wonderfully, profoundly, lovingly you surrendered it up to take the contagion of my sin, of our sins, the sin of the whole world, to bear it before the Father, complete the penalty and the punishment on our behalf, to leave us with nothing but the power that is yours, the righteousness that is yours, and to be covered in it but also by the Spirit to be filled with its energies. Let us choose that, O oh God. Let us worship you and choose that. May it also be our purpose and design then in obedience to know you, to glory in you, to let the Spirit do what the shy one does, exalt the Son, incarnating himself in our bodies, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.